So if Arthur Benjamin isn't a genius, who is? It's a question science struggles with as much as anyone else. So in this program, I want to find out how science is trying to understand extreme talent and to get to grips with why some people are smarter than others. I'll ask whether geniuses are born or made. Is this man a grand master because he has the right genes? Can this baby really achieve anything she sets her mind to? Or is her destiny already determined by the wiring of her brain? I'll find out why these blue and yellow spots can help us detect innate abilities. And I'll discover why this man's brain sheds light on one of the most intriguing characteristics of genius. The question of why we all have different intellectual abilities has always engaged the minds of scientists. And not so long ago, many of them thought the answer to be quite simple. All it took was a decent anatomist to open up a skull and measure the brain's vital statistics. I guess the idea of cutting up somebody's brain to see what makes them intelligent or not it does make me a little bit uneasy. Uh, the search for intelligence via brain dissection doesn't really have an illustrious history. At the start of the 20th century, donating one's brain to science was all the rage. The popular assumption was that a heavy brain was a better brain. Dozens of high-profile citizens had the contents of their skulls weighed and splayed. Napoleon II's brain weighed 1,500 grams. The novelist Thackeray's brain weighed in at a mighty 1,636 grams. And yet Charles Babbage, the father of computing and to many a genius if ever there was one, his brain was a paltry 1,403. It was this crude approach that brought the search for genius via brain dissection into disrepute. If you believe, as I do, that your thoughts are physically encoded in your brain, then you do have to conclude that the architecture of the brain must reflect in some way the way that you think. 